But it's my privilege tonight to introduce to you our guest speaker for, as Andy has said, the second night of Values Emphasis Week, Jack Kershula. And Jack's a, Jack's a good friend, Jack's a, a great leader, and someone that I have great respect for and I can't wait for you to hear this evening. He's president of a company called Trust in Us, LLC, and that's a, a really first-class executive search firm that does work for CEOs and other C-level business leaders, both in the for-profit and the not-for-profit and government sectors. Um, as Jack knows virtually everybody in Metro Detroit and has been very helpful in a lot of the, uh, the biggest and strongest organizations that you would know in Metro Detroit in selecting their leaders. He's the consummate entrepreneur. He's an individual that uh, has had entrepreneurial blood in him from day one, uh, growing up on the south side of Chicago, uh, knowing that he wanted to, to get beyond his neighborhood. His dad was a postal worker and a great man that I've had the privilege to, to get to know through the years who really inspired him. You'll probably hear about uh, his dad, Buddy, a little bit in his talk tonight because Buddy is, is somebody that makes it, made an impact on all of us during his long lifetime. But Jack went out and started a business called Decision Consultants back in 1976. And that business uh, he took from a one-man shop to having about 1,800 employees and having annual revenue of $150 million a year. He grew it into the largest IT services firm in the country at that time. And then he decided to sell the firm because as many entrepreneurs for him, it was about the journey, not necessarily about the destination. And he started trusting us, and he started a number of other efforts to help other people in Metro Detroit and across our state and literally across the country. One of the things Jack does is a radio show on WJR uh, called Anything is Possible. It's on Sunday evenings, and over the last 10 years, he's had the good fortune, I guess it's really about 11 years now, uh, he's had the good fortune to interview some of the greatest leaders in this country. People like uh, Coach Lou Holtz from Notre Dame and uh, Senator Jack McCain and, and Mitch Albom, the columnist and author and many, many other leaders that, that have real values in their lives. In addition to all of that, Jack has the greatest autograph and sports marketing and sports art collection that I've ever seen in my entire life. And the nice thing about Jack is he shares that with, with other people, with other not-for-profit organizations. Um, he's got, I don't even know the number, over 100,000 maybe autographs of various people. He has something that is autographed and signed by every single president of the United States, going back to George Washington. He has, he has autographs of all the all-star teams. Whoops, yeah, we'll fix that. He has, uh, he has uh, autographs of all the all-star teams going back for about the last 30, 40 years. Things that he created that no one else had thought to do where he would send them around to those that were selected for the all-stars in the NFL or the NBA or Major League Baseball or um, uh, you name it, and he would then create a collection that virtually no one else has. In addition to that, he has his own uh, artist that works with him on sports art um, that now hangs in the Hall of Fame in places like Canton, Ohio for the National Football League and um, basketball and hockey and baseball. He is, he is an individual that truly, truly values sports in this country and has, has lived those values throughout his life. So he's an entrepreneur, he's a great leader, he's someone that respects what you are doing uh, as students and student athletes at this institution. So let's have a warm Northwood welcome for Jack Krishula. Good evening and thanks for having me. Uh, I've also had Kim Yost as a guest, Ellen West as a guest, and the biggest guest ever, Keith Pretty. So what if we start tonight by a, a moment of silence? When you woke up this morning, 
it was another tragic day for the world. So what if we have a moment of silence for the people of Belgium, the ones that lost their life, their loved ones, etc. Thank you. It's an honor to be here. Uh, hopefully you've got uh, a book. And the first page is something that I read recently. It's a gloomy moment in the history of our country. Not in the lifetime of most men has there been so much grave and deep apprehension. Never has the future seemed so incalculable as at this time. The domestic economic situation is in chaos. Our dollar is weak throughout the world. Prices are so high to be utterly impossible. The political cauldron seethes and bubbles with uncertainty. The rest of the world hangs as usual like a cloud, dark and silent upon the horizon. It's a solemn moment of our troubles. No man can see the end. And based on what happened this morning, that could be tomorrow's article on page one of newspapers. This is something that I read in Harper's Weekly in their October issue. Their October 1857 issue. That was 158 years ago. My Cubs haven't won the World Series in 109 years. This is the year. Um, that's a long time. This is not the typical way to start an inspirational talk. The point is, we've always had troubles. You hear all this stuff about America's greatest days are over, all of this animosity between the two sides on the political spectrum. Don't let that get you down. Don't let that change your dreams or stop you from doing what God wants you to do. There's been 10 billion people to walk the face of the earth, never one exactly like you. Never will be, never was. We're all unique, and God's got a great plan for every one of us. Part of your job is to figure out what that is and live your life to make that happen. Page two. A quote, everything that can be invented has been invented. That astute quote was from a man named Charles Duell in 1899. Charles was the director of the US Patent Office. So he was a little bit wrong. Our Senate that year came within two votes, Andy, of abolishing the patent office because they believed everything that had been, could be invented had been invented. So our senators haven't changed much in the last 116 years either. Okay? A lot of people are always going to tell you what you can't do, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Don't listen to them. As Keith said, I've been blessed to have this radio show and meet phenomenal people. I always meet the people ahead of time, have dinner with them. I've had dinner with three Miss Americas. They've all told me I have a great face for radio. <laughs> they all, each of them told me I look like their grandfather, OK? Uh, I've, had, I've had seven astronauts on the show. 50 Hall of Famers, on and on and on. So I've heard a lot of great stories from people, and I've tried to learn. Let's talk about Wilma Rudolph. She was born in the 40s. She was the 20th of 22 children from very humble beginnings. And her challenge was that she had polio. That's a disease that you don't really hear about today, but when I was a kid, there were a lot of kids and adults with braces on their legs because of polio. 
I believe that Franklin Roosevelt had polio. And they would never film him, you know, below the waist. So, doctor says, you're never going to walk. And then they took the braces off when she was 11 years old, and they said, try to walk, try to run to strengthen your legs. So she starts to run, 20 of the 22 kids. And she gets to be a pretty good runner. And the U.S. Olympics in 1960 were in Rome. She's representing our country. And she wins three gold medals for the 100-yard, the 200-yard, and the 4 by 100. She becomes the fastest woman on earth with polio. So when I saw a movie about her, I thought, maybe there are things more possible than I think. Um, there was a man, Harry Houdini, many decades ago, and he was probably the world's greatest escape artist. You could put him in a casket. You could do whatever you wanted, lock him up, chains, etc., and he could get out. And he had a standing commitment that if you put him in a jail cell, lock the door, as long as you let him go in with his clothes on, he'd get out within an hour. 33 straight times, they did it. He was out in an hour. The 34th time was a new jail in Mexico. And it was a hot summer afternoon. And as kind of a grand opening celebration, they had Houdini come down. Okay, And all the townspeople were there. And they put Houdini in the cell, closed the door, and Houdini starts to go to work has files and everything. Everything he's trying doesn't work. And he's mystified and frustrated. Half an hour, 45 minutes, an hour. He had been out but 33 straight times in less than an hour. Hour and a half, two hours, he can't figure out what's wrong. And then he collapses from exhaustion. Hot summer afternoon. And when he collapses, he falls forward against the door, and the cell opens. They never locked the jail door. It's the only time he didn't get out. But in his heart, that door was as locked as any door has ever been locked. If you think you can, or if you think you can't, you're right. Half of the battle is believing you can do something. That's half the battle. Then you've got to put forth the effort, et cetera, et cetera, to make it happen. But you've got to believe in your heart. You've got to believe in yourself. Um, okay? There's a man in Gross Point named Mike Timmis, phenomenal guy. He met a man, Chuck Colson, who started Prison Fellowship. And Mike became chairman worldwide of prison fellowship. He went to 112 countries on his own dime to go into prisons to talk to prisoners about this Jewish carpenter from Nazareth and talk to the presidents of the countries and dictators about improving conditions in these jails. And in the early 2000, I was blessed to go with him to Slovakia, Romania, and the Czech Republic. So he's been to 112 countries on his own money. And one March day, we're outside Prague. Prague, Prague is a beautiful little city, Czech Republic. They call it the Little Paris. If you ever get a chance to go to Prague, go. If you ever get a chance to go to Paris, go. Uh, your dad's got to take you guys to Paris someday, okay? <laughs> and we go outside Prague, and we come to this dormitory building. It was a four-story dorm building. And we meet a nun, Sister Consolata, beautiful lady. She might have been 40 years old. 
And she's running this with three other nuns. So there's four nuns that run this place. And it, it looks like a, a student dorm building with four stories. And on the third and fourth floor were 80 women prisoners. It was a jail run by four nuns. If you look, there's no bars on the windows. There was no lock on the front door. It had been going on for 12 years. No woman had ever escaped. Two were in for murder, killed their husbands. I don't know the specifics, but I'm sure they were justified. <laughs> okay. Four nuns, 80 women prisoners with no locks on the doors or bars on the windows. On floor one and two were 120 nursing home residents, older women. And every morning, those female prisoners would come down from the third and fourth floor to take care of these older women. And in turn, the older women would change in the hearts of these prison ladies, along with four nuns. And we got back in the car, and Mike Timmis says, Jack, I have seen everything. What we just saw is impossible. With God, nothing is impossible. Karoli Takics from Hungary. It's 1940 going to have the Olympics, and he's the best pistol shooter in the world. He's favored to win the gold medal in pistol shooting. You work your whole life to become the best at something, and right-handed. And then because of the Second World War, those Olympics got canceled. And karoli has got to go into the military for Hungary. An accident, and he loses his right hand. That's like Clayton Kershaw losing his left hand. That's like Jordan Spieth losing one of his hands. That's like Steph Curry losing one of his hands, or Tom Brady. He's the best in the world. Coordination between hand and eye. What would we do if that happened to us? Guys, what Caroli did was he took the pistol with the left hand. I don't think we would want to be too close to him the first few times he was shooting. We had this vice president, Dick Cheney, that wasn't a great shot. Shot one of his friends one day, <laughs> hunting together. Okay? Couldn't hit the broad side of a barn. 1948, Hungary sends him to the Olympics, Melbourne, Australia, to represent them. Pistol shooting. And he wins a gold medal. Sets an all-time record with the left hand. Wow. Well, we could never do that, Jack. I'm not so sure. Siri says there's 30 Major League Baseball teams. We were debating whether 30 or 32. Okay, each team has 25 players. Ten of them are pitchers, so let's not count those. That means there's 15 guys who bet. So 30 times 15, I think is 450 major league hitters. Okay? Of those 400, and those are the best in the world. They've worked their whole life. Of those 450, 10, 11, or 12 of them this year will bet 300 or better. That means that for every 10 times they come up, they will get a hit three times. There will only be 10, 11, or 12 of them. If you play 15 years and you're a 300 career batting average, you're in the Hall of Fame. Toughest Hall of Fame to get into is baseball. Spent since 1869, 
And there's a, only 193 players ever in the Baseball Hall of Fame. Then there's umpires, managers, owners, etc. Okay? All right. A player's healthy. He plays most every day. He's got 600 at-bats in the season. If you walk or if there's an error, that doesn't count as an at-bat. Okay. Any math majors, if I come up to bat 600 times, how many hits do I have to get to be a 300 hitter? Pardon? 180. 200 is 333. Okay, so 180 hits equals a 300 hitter. How many hits do I have to get to be a 250 hitter if I bat 600 times? 150. That's a 250 hitter. The difference, friends, is 30 hits in the year. They play six months of baseball. I think they play 28 weeks of baseball. The 300 hitter, only 12 of them, they get one extra hit a week. That's all, as opposed to the 250 hitter. The difference is that small, from great to phenomenal, and never given up. Ray Kroc was a guy from Chicago, and he was an entrepreneur. And he was an inventor. And he was very, very good at inventing things. And then he would create a manufacturing company to produce these things, which he was good at. But he wasn't good at sales. So 29 times in a row, he had to file bankruptcy. That was 0 for 29. If we were 0 for 29, what would we do? Ray Kroc, what he did was he came up with a machine that would make six milkshakes at once. Myself, your grandparents, some of your parents, used to go to this fountain store. If you grew up in Indiana, you're still going to the fountain store, I think. And They'd have two of these machines that would only make one at a time. And if there were six of us, we would do something we call, we would wait. And we would talk to each other. <laughs> All right? We'd look at each other in the eye and we'd talk. And we just would wait. So he makes this machine that would make six at a time. And he produces a bunch of them. He's well on his way to his 30th failure. And then he gets a call from Los Angeles from Brothers and they say, we want to buy five of those. And he says, you don't understand. Each one of these makes six at a time. Milk six. And they say, yeah, we understand. We want five. So he drives from Des Plaines, Illinois, to LA, and he meets the McDonald brothers, who have this little restaurant selling hamburgers, fries, and milkshakes. This was in the early 50s. And Croc sees this and says, we're going to get rich. We're going to put these all over the world. And they says, no, no, we just want this one store. <laughs> just give us the five milkshake makers. So he buys them out. He adds the golden arches. And the rest is history. Changed the world. But most people don't know he failed 29 times in a row. I've had close to 600 guests on the show. The best one is a 32-year-old kid named Nick Vujicic. I had him when he was 23, then when he was 26, then about a year ago for the 500th show, I asked him to come back for the 500th show. If it be true that we have to be God's arms and legs, and I think that's true, I've never met a person that does that better than Nick Vujicic, who, if you notice, 
has no arms and no legs. He was born with no stumps. He has a little seven inch, he calls it his chicken bone right here. He's married, he just had a second child. He, he, billions of hits on YouTubes. In 2014, he reached 6% of the world's population. He reached 400 million people. He's the next, he's your generation's Billy Graham. You've got to look him up. Billions of hits. There's YouTube videos all over the place on him. He uses humor phenomenally well. If he came in here, they'd put him up on a table, you know, and you're afraid to kind of come close and come on close, come on close. And Amber, would you hug me? I'm not really into shaking hands, you know? <laughs> so he, he overcomes your reluctance. He'll tell you that he's now met 30 people worldwide that he can wrestle with. He's met 30 other people with no limbs. He's 23 years old. And he says, Jack, the word disable. If you take the word disable and you put a G and an O in front of it, you get God is able. He's 23 years old. He's 26 years old. I say, Nick, for the first 12 years of your life, you hated God. You were bullied. You know, you wanted to commit suicide. He says, yeah, Jack, but it's kind of hard to do when you don't got no arms or legs. <laughs> okay? And I said, all right, if God came down today and said, Nick, I will give you those arms and those legs that you cursed me for, you begged me for, your choice, do you want them? He's 26 years old. He says, let me tell you a story, Jack. He said, six months ago, I was in Liberia, talking to about 20,000 people on a hot summer night, and they're sitting on a hilltop. And in Liberia, if you're born with a blemish, they end your life. And here's the dictator of the country, dictator of the country in the first row. So Nick's talking, and he says, I see this woman coming with a blanket, a real hot summer night, and she's coming through the crowd for like 45 minutes. And she comes right up to the stage, puts the blanket down, opens the blanket, holds up her infant son, Monet, missing an arm. And the crowd goes crazy. The mom has sentenced her son to instant death. Here's the dictator right there. I mean, that's the rules of the country. That's the culture. So Nick says, I quit saying what I was saying. He's got this ability to kind of fall down, and with this little seven-inch chicken claw, he can jump back up. So he says, I go and I hug the baby. And I say a little prayer, and then I get up, and I start telling them how special this baby is to God. And now he's going to change the country. And he's going to become one of the most well-known librarians of all time. 300 years from now, everybody's going to know him. He's going to change the country. And Jack, I'm happy to say that in the last six months, they haven't murdered a child because of a blemish. And if I had the arms and the legs, that would have never happened. So no thank God, I don't need the arms and the legs. He says, you don't know what it's like having no arms and legs and having your three-year-old son, Kiyoshi, hug you. He says, you talk about special. A year ago, 500th show, we're talking, and he says, Jack, can I tell you about a miracle that I just witnessed? I says, go ahead. He says, well, it's the 13th one I've witnessed. I was in Mumbai, India recently. And he's got a guy that goes with him, and they got a little motorized cart and carries him around. And, and um, he said, we went to an area in Mumbai 
that for the last 40 years has been a sex trafficking area, many square blocks long. And there are literally a couple thousand young Indian girls that are sex slaves. And in many cases, the mom or the dad has sold the girl into slavery for $300. So Nick says, we talked to about 50 of them that night. And we had enough money to buy three of them out of slavery. And the majority of them turned their life over to Christ that night. So it was a very, very successful night. We get back in the van, and Marty was his driver. You know, dark, very narrow streets. And Marty's getting ready to go away. And Nick says, um, Marty, we gotta go in that, we gotta go in that house right there. Marty says, No, Nick, we, we gotta get the hell out of here, Nick. <laughs> okay. They're gonna kill us. Okay. We they don't want us. We don't belong here, okay? Um, no, no, no. God just told me I gotta go in that house. It's a brothel. Marty says, Well, God might have told you that, but God's telling me get the hell out of here, okay? <laughs> All right? Nick says, hey. Let me out. If you go, fine. i got to go to that house. God told me. So, okay, Marty says, okay, let's go. So they go in the brothel. And there's, I guess, hundreds of these brothels. And here's this old madame. And he rolls in this 32-year-old, you know, kid. And she says, who are you? Well, I'm Nick Vujicic from Los Angeles. And she says, what are you doing here? He says, well... My God told me to come in here. She says, are you the kid that was here talking to the girls, creating all this ruckus and everything? She starts cussing and swearing, get out of here, I'm going to kill you, this and this and this. And Nick says, ma'am, I don't know why, but why did God tell me to come in here? At the time, he's 31 years old. And she's, you know, cussing, swearing, get out of here, I'm going to kill you. Ma'am, I'm here for a reason. So she says, okay, follow me. So she takes him into a back room, tiny room, no light, and here's a mattress on the floor, and here's a real old lady laying on the mattress. And the madame says, that woman hasn't been able to walk in five years. She's my older sister. Make a walk. So Marty takes him, puts him on the mattress. Nick hugs the old lady, and he starts to pray. And he says, ma'am, get up. She can't get up. The madame starts laughing, mocking him. You know, your God is a phony, this and this. You know, get out of here. You know, they're going to kill you. So Nick prays a little more. And the woman gets up and starts to walk after five years. So then the madame says, oh, that ain't your God. <laughs> that, ain't your, that ain't your God. <laughs> well, <laughs> hey, all I know is my God come in here just in five minutes, and this woman ain't walked in five years, and she's walking. And the woman that was walking says, I believe. I believe. So Marty says, let's get the hell out of here. Okay? And they get him back in the van, and they're going away. And Marty says, Nick, do you, do you know what just happened? And Nick says, I, I think we witnessed another miracle by God. Well, do you know what really just happened? Yeah, that, that, that older woman was the older sister of the madame, and she hadn't walked in five years, and she walked. God made her walk. And we got to witness that. Nick, do you know what really just happened? Well, that's really what just happened. What happened? Nick, that old woman was the woman that started this sex trafficking trade 45 years ago. She was the original madame. With God, 
anything is possible. I've never met a man that does a better job of being God's arms and legs than Nick Vujicic, who, guys, has no arms and no legs. Maggie Cook. Hmm, wow. I don't think she's 35 years old. She was, grew up in Mexico. She's five foot two. She's a dynamo. And she was an orphan. So a man and a woman adopted her. And they had eight biological children. And they adopted Maggie and 59 other kids. She was one of 68 brothers and sisters. She learned to eat fast. <laughs> she didn't talk at the dinner table. She just ate when they had food. Many times they didn't have food. She talks about that the kids would have to go hunting with knives and nets. And she said, I'd be up in a tree. And we'd hunt foxes and deer. And we'd jump out of the tree, you know, pounce on the deer, and then we'd kill them. We had to eat. But there was a lot of love in the family. So she's 17 years old. And for some reason, the mom and dad decide, we're going we're gonna to get a bus, an old bus. And we're going to go from Mexico to Washington, D.C. The 70 of us. And they would go for two days till they ran out of money. And then they would all work for a couple days in whatever town they were in, doing whatever people would pay them to do so that they get a little more money for gas and food for another few days. A couple more days, stop, work again. So it took them a couple months, and they got to Charleston, South Carolina. And with 68 brothers and sisters, you could play a lot of sports. She was a good basketball player at 5'2". Did not speak a word of English. And they got an outdoor basketball court that they saw, and some of the brothers and sisters were playing. They start to play, and there's a woman watching them. And the woman was the head coach of Charleston, University of Charleston basketball team. And she offers Maggie a scholarship to play basketball. Five foot two. So, plays four years, gets a degree, and then uh, she's got some tough times. She's homeless for three months, living in her car. And she was pretty good at making salsa. A lot of people in Mexico are good at making salsa. And so a friend said, Maggie, in Charleston, every year they've got this salsa contest. You should enter. So somebody helps her buy the stuff. She enters, and she wins the salsa contest in Charleston, South Carolina. Then some guy gives her $800 to start a business. And she builds the business. And then a couple years ago, a guy named Jack Aronson meets her. It's a multi-million dollar salsa company called Maggie's Salsa. And Jack Aronson buys the business for seven figures. He's the man that started Garden Fresh. He and his wife just sold it to Campbell's last May for $220 million. That's a lot of salsa and chips <laughs> and hummus, <laughs> okay? Now Maggie's a minister at Renaissance Unity Church. It's written a book, Mindful Success. Phenomenal stuff. One last one, Nancy Lopez, also Hispanic. Grew up in Roswell, New Mexico. Very, very poor. Dad loved to golf. So didn't have any sons, and he teaches this Nancy Lopez to golf. 
they had a problem in that no country clubs would ever let them play because they were Hispanic. So they had to play in the streets, et cetera, et cetera, with whatever she had. And she got to be a very good golfer. In 1978, at age 28, she wins five tournaments in a row. She won nine tournaments that year as a 21-year-old kid. The average amount she won was $13,000 for first prize. Because back then, women's golf was nothing. You know, you had the King Arnold Palmer's tournament last week. The King put golf for men on TV. Arnie's Army. The female version of Arnold Palmer is Nancy Lopez. She put women's golf on TV. In 79, at age 22, she wins nine times again. Won 18 times in two years. Phenomenal lady, has given back dramatically. The next is a little resume or a little encapsulation of a loser. If Mr. Kripe saw this resume of a high school senior, he'd say, uh, <laughs> you better go to Michigan. You better go to Michigan, okay? <laughs> we ain't for you. On the left is what happened to him, and on the right is his age. So fail in business, ran for legislature, defeated, fail in business, elected, sweetheart died, had a nervous breakdown, defeated, 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 defeated. For any of you ladies, if you ever fall in love with a guy with this resume, and you bring him home to dad, <laughs> no way, Jose, honey. <laughs> okay, it ain't going to happen. That's a loser. Well, he tried once again. And when he was 51 years old, he ran for president of the United States of America. And he won. And he became our 16th president, arguably our greatest president, Abraham Lincoln. That was his life. People are going to tell you, they're going to mock you, bully you, steal from you, ignore you, do everything to you. Don't let them rain on your parade. Mother Teresa, who's going to be made a saint, canonized a saint, I think it's September. It was just announced. In Calcutta, she had a little room with a bed, a chest of drawers, a crucifix on the wall, and this poem. That's all she had. And a habit. Change the world. People are often unreasonable, illogical, and self-centered. Forgive them anyway. If you're kind to people, people may accuse you of selfish ulterior motives. Monet, people will accuse you. <laughs> Not may, will. Be kind anyway. If you're successful, you'll win some false friends and some true enemies. Succeed anyway. If you're honest and frank, people may cheat you. People will cheat you. Be honest and frank anyway. What you spend years building, someone could destroy overnight. Build it anyway. If you find serenity and happiness, people may be jealous. People will be jealous. Be happy anyway. The good you do today, people will forget tomorrow. In today's world, the good you do this morning, they done already forgot it at noon. Okay? I mean, some of these Michigan State fans want to fire Tom Izzo. Think about that. Do good anyway. Give the world the best you have, and it may never be enough. Give the world the best you've got anyways. You see, in the final analysis, it's between you and God. It never was between you and them anyway. The th in closing, the three greatest days in the history of the world were the day that the Jewish carpenter was born, the day that the Jewish carpenter died for our sins, and three days later, when he arose from the dead. In a couple days, we're going to celebrate two of those three days. The greatest act of love in the history of the world, guys, 
was this. That's the greatest act of love in the history of the world. In the Bible, the most used phrase in that book is not love your God, and it's not love your neighbor. 365 times in the book, it says, be not afraid. And boy, we're afraid today. Be not afraid. So, he gets crucified for our sins on Good Friday. He rises on Easter Sunday. And then he's with his followers for 40 days. Kind of going in and out of buildings periodically. And then, then he ascends to heaven 40 days later. And all of his followers are there saying, don't, don't go. And as he's ascending, the last thing he says is, I am with you always. A flea doesn't die without him knowing it. A bird doesn't lose a feather without him knowing it. He can count coaches every hair on his head. For Andy and I, that ain't much counting. <laughs> okay? Use it while you got it, guys. Use it while you got it. All right? He knows everything about you. And as much as your moms love you, and hopefully as much as your dads love you, pales in comparison to how much he loves you. And he needs all the great athletes he can find now in the world. Because we've made a mess of it. So he's got great, great plans with you. Let go and let God. Let him use you. God bless. It's an honor to be here. Thank you, Jack. Now we're going to move into our Q&A se session. So if any of you have written any questions you'd like for us to read, can you please pass it to the inside aisle, and someone will be by to pick those up. In the meantime, while we're getting those picked up, we're going to start with a few questions that we already have for you. Okay. Okay. What inspired you to start your own business? What inspired you to start basically the journey that you're on now? Oh. Guys, I, I didn't learn entrepreneurship at the dinner table. I learned that how to sort mail, and I learned that at least in Chicago, the even number houses were on this side of the street, and the odd number houses were on this side of the street. And then we also learned be good to people and work hard. I took one course in programming. That's all we had in college. I got a job with Illinois Bell. They taught me how to program. I went and got a master's degree at Loyola from Rush Street while I was working at Little Illinois Bell during the day. Really got the master's on Rush Street rather than from Loyola. I was still living at home. I had never been on an airplane. And I get a call from a guy, Bobby Guy Stevenson, a Texan. And he's with a consulting company. He says, Jack, we got this terrific opportunity here in Detroit. We want you to come. We want to hire you. And we're going to open an office in Chicago in six months. We'll move you right back. I'd never been on an airplane. I just wanted to go on an airplane. So I go. They hire me. They never opened the office in Chicago. And I was with them for four years on engagements. And there was a man at American Motors, Marty Mutz. It's an unbelievable story. And one day he gives me a little book, not much bigger than this. And he says, Jack, I bought this book. I want you to do it. Read it. Do what's in it. Come back. I'm going to do business with you. And it was how to incorporate for $29.95. So I did it. And he gave me my first piece of business. 26 years later, 1,800 people. It's 2002. We sell the business for a lot of zeros. A lot of zeros. And we sell it to a company called Cyber, a public firm out of Denver. And the chairman of the board of Cyber was a Texan named Bobby Guy Stevenson. The guy that recruited me 26 years before bought the business for $150 million. So the man gave me a book. 
just gave me a book. That was that God using Marty Mutz. But I seized that opportunity. God is and will give you guys such opportunities. Don't be afraid, okay? Seize it. Mitch Album says that he's been around a lot of people who have been dying, you know, Tuesdays with Maury, et cetera, et cetera. And he says what he's found is when the person's on their deathbed, they don't want all the trophies, the St. John's outfits, all the cars, you know. <laughs> they want their loved ones around them. And they never lament or they're never sad about the things they tried that didn't work out. What they're sad about is the dreams they had that they never seized. They wanted to go to Paris, but it was never the right time. Seize your dreams. Okay, well, the next question is, what advice can you give someone wanting to start their own business? When it's a, when it's a person of faith on the show, I always ask him or her to lead us in a closing prayer. Otherwise, my last question is always, what advice would you give to our young listeners tonight? I don't give you the question ahead of time. It's always been the same answer. Figure out what you love to do. It's got to be something that helps people. Well, I love to drink beer and lay on the beach. Uh, Maria Kardashian, okay? <laughs> All right. Uh, it's got to be something to help people. Figure out. God's got special plans for you. His plans for us is always greater than our own plans. When we pray, we're always telling him what we want him to do. He knows better than us <laughs> what's right for us. His ways aren't our ways. But let him use you. Figure out what you love to do. Give it your all. Don't look back every other hour. You know, you're going to fail, you're going to fail, you're going to fail. Don't look back. Give it your all. You've got to associate, you've got to gather some people that are very good at what they're doing, and they've got to buy into your dream. The entrepreneur has a great idea. But left to his or her own fruition, nothing happens. He's got to get others to help turn that dream into the reality. But you need the leader with the dream. So if you want to start a business, figure out what you'd love to do, whether it's a restaurant, whether it's sales, whatever. Give it your all. Don't ever give up. And then the last thing they say is, and the rest will follow. 30, 40 years from now, you'll look back and say, man, how did it happen? Hey, there were a lot of detours, a lot of setbacks. But look at Keith Pretty. He was a kid from Down River, OK? And a pretty good athlete. He gets drafted by Green Bay Packers. I think they gave him an offer as a signing bonus for either $1,000 or $2,000 or a new Pinto. Look at the size of him. <laughs> he took the Pinto. You know, he wasn't the sharpest knife in the drawer back then, you know. Um, meets Gretchen. Life changed. He outkicked his punt coverage when he married your mom. Phenomenal what the man has done. And this has been a, Northwood's been a blessing for the Pretty family, but boy, Northwood has been blessed by having the Pretty family here. The rest will follow. Give it your all. One last question to wrap this up. What made you want to have a radio talk show? Oh, shit. 
I've been blessed to have a couple of uh, lunches with Bill Gates. You know, he started a company called Microsoft. He and his wife, Melinda, have now donated more money than anybody in the history of the world. And he told me, he says, Jack, if the truth be known, anybody who starts a business that becomes successful, they become successful in spite of themselves. It's one mistake after another after another, and you keep going. Now, hopefully, you don't make the same mistake over and over. When you start a business, a $50 mistake, that's a, that's a big mistake. Then you get, you know, a little big for your britches, then it's a $500 mistake. Then a $5,000, $50,000. Then you get up to a million dollar mistake. It's just more zeros, guys, as you get bigger. But we, we had a phenomenal friend, Mike Feasy. And um, he was the president of WGR Radio. And then about four or five years ago, he quit that to become the president of Huntington Bank of Michigan. Guys, Mike Feasy didn't owe a credit from a debit. <laughs> I'm not sure Feasy could tell us, <laughs> you know, how many hits in 600 to get to 300, okay? Uh, <laughs> and we were golfing 11 years ago. I had never been on the radio, ever. And I said, Mike, you need something positive on WJR. You got all this screaming every day. Rush Slimeball, that's what my dad used to call him, Rush Slimeball. Sean Hannity, Dr. Laura. I said, Mother Teresa could call in, and the Dr. Laura would be pounding on Mother Teresa. <laughs> okay? You, you got to have something positive on it, WJR. He said, well, like what? I said, you should have one show a week where you highlight one person. Let them tell their story to inspire people. He said, well, like who? I said, I'll send you some names. Guys, I never said I should be the host. I'd never been on the radio. And it's WJR. So I sent him. Ernie Banks, my hero, Mr. Cub, John McCain, Father Hesburgh of Notre Dame, Dennis Archer, Eleanor. I didn't know these people. I just wrote these names down. And he calls me a week later. He says, Jack, I love the idea. And I think you'd be great as the host. <laughs> wow. I was awful. The first guest I ever had was Ernie Harwell. Show got over Sunday at 10 o'clock. Half a minute later, I got a phone call from Mike Feasy. Jack, we're going to have breakfast tomorrow at 7 o'clock in the morning, you and I, son. Okay. And he taught me how to be a radio person. I've always said, I'm not the host. I'm the beneficiary. One more story. To go to Pensacola, Florida, and have dinner with a guy named Gene Cernan. He's the first American to ever walk in space. He's hanging on a rope, guys, going 18,000 miles an hour. We've never done it before. And he said, for 60 minutes, this is 360 degrees. Then when you're on the back side of the Earth, it's negative 360 degrees. That's 30 minutes. He says, everything they told me, it didn't work. He says, but it's amazing. You're hanging on this rope, going 18,000 miles an hour, and you look down, and you see the Mississippi River. And you look over there, and you see where it starts in Minnesota. And then you look over there, and you see the Gulf of Mexico at where it ends. Then you look forward, and you see the Atlantic Ocean. You turn your back, and you see the Pacific Ocean. He says, at one point, I figured out how to take three steps. He had 150 pounds on his back, weightless, you know. I took three steps, and I had crossed the Gulf of Mexico. Gene Cernan is the 12th and the last man on the moon. He spent 75 hours, he said, on God's porch, talking to God, looking at the earth, which from the moon is about this big, with 7 billion of us, with a lot of blue, a lot of white, 
and some green. And he says, you can't tell where Bolivia ends and Uruguay begins. He says, we're all one people So when you're on the moon looking at the earth. To have those kind of experiences, phenomenal, a blessing. And it's been a blessing to be here. Thanks a million.